Hey uh, everyone, welcome back to the second session on Mastering Divine Healing. Uh, let's resume the way we left off. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, great, so uh, we concluded the last session with uh, talking about the third principle, which is on the flow of compassion. So uh, in the first session, we covered the first three principles, which is the will of God, the exercise of faith, and the flow of compassion. Uh, well, I just want to pause here, just one quick uh, you know, a minute, and I want to acknowledge the question, which was posted by John. Um, John, so uh, as mentioned, right, your question was uh, related to John chapter 5. And so what what really happened uh, at the pool of Bethesda, isn't it? Like, how did the healing happen? Um, so, as I've mentioned, so history claims, like, you know, that an angel would come and stir the waters, and the first person uh, to, uh, to enter the pool would be healed. Uh, those, those are the claims of history. However, as mentioned, the Bible doesn't teach that, so uh, we don't really know for sure. Uh, but you know, a couple of things what we know uh, is that this pool was was outside of Jerusalem, just of, you know, say the town, uh, so to speak. Uh, the Sheep Gate, uh, from, I think John chapter five, anyway. Sheep Gate is normally the northern side of Jerusalem. So these are the only things that. At least I know, you know, I'm aware of uh, about the pool, but then, uh, and everything else is kind of what the history says. So, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, have... okay, no problem. Thanks. Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, so we look at, move on to the fourth principle, uh, is anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. So. Um, we have emphasized the necessity of the power of the Holy Spirit in ministering, healing, and deliverance. We have em emphasized on it more than a couple of times uh, in previous chapters. Uh, simply because uh, we know that Jesus right, ministered by the power of the Spirit. Right? Everything Jesus did, uh, every healing miracle that he performed, was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so we learn to grow in the anointing and minister out of the anointing. We learn to grow in the anointing and minister out of the anointing. Okay? We are sensitive to the flowing of God's Spirit and the flowing of anointing of God and yield to this when ministering, healing, and deliverance. Okay? Once again, the choice of words used are we are sensitive. Uh, in, in the previous uh, examples we saw, we have to be in tune uh, with what the Father is doing and what He wants to do, right? So in other words, uh, here is simply being that we need to be sensitive to the flowing of the Spirit of God, okay, uh, to what He wants to do. So uh, recognize the importance of those whom God has specially called and anointed in certain areas, okay? Um, an example mentioned here is we know that God has anointed healing evangelists and workers of miracles. We know that there are certain people anointed to minister in certain ways and for specific kinds of needs as well. Okay. We are also sensitive to the spiritual atmosphere that is conducive to the flow of the anointing. We know that there is a lot of prayer, intense worship, great faith, and high level of expectancy. We have spiritual environment, okay, most conducive to the flow of God's anointing for healings and miracles to happen. Hence, we try to create the right spiritual atmosphere for the flow of anointing. Okay, so what is it all talking about? Right? So when you're in church or a miracle crusade, a healing crusade, or healing meeting, etc., etc. Um, 
we kind of get to this uh, act of worship. We sing songs. We worship God. We invite his presence, right? We uh, ask for his presence, for his kingdom to come and invade our realm, for him to come and do what he does best, for the Holy Spirit to flow, right? And so during the towards uh, ministry time at APC, uh, you know, after the word is being preached, pastor invites the worship team back on stage um, you know, to lead into a time of worship, and then we start ministering and releasing the word of knowledge, words of knowledge and releasing prophetic, calling out, uh, you know, declaring healing and calling out sicknesses and declaring healing over people. So all of that is we are moving in tune with the Holy Spirit. Right. We ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us in, in, in private, right, in our uh, in a quiet time. Uh, you know, we lock the door, we pray, we seek and we ask him for his anointing to increase in our lives. More of him, we, we develop that intimacy. And then when we come together as a corporate, right, okay, we have, uh, you know, when we come together, we have a worship team to lead us in a time of worship that kind of sets the tone, uh, brings, uh, changes the atmosphere. We ask for God's holy presence to come and change, uh, change lives, right? That's the idea, that's, that's the norm. Okay. Um, however, say, you know, when you're at your workplace and, and wherever that is, you don't have the worship team with you all the time, uh, right? Well, what, what are you going to do at the time? It's like, you know, I don't have a Bluetooth speaker to play you know, worship songs and just create that tone and whatnot. Um, now we look at the exceptions of it, okay? So, what we have described about, or what is described about, is the norm. But we must learn to desire for more of his anointing and help create a spiritual environment. Right? It's so important, isn't it, guys? Like the spiritual atmosphere, the spiritual environment. Right? Jesus recognized the unbelief in the atmosphere of a town. Right? The spiritual environment was, the tone was not right. In Nazareth, or you know, where we, where he could not perform, um, you know, healings and miracles because of their unbelief. So therefore, we must learn to desire for more of his anointing to help create a spiritual environment. Okay, that will help the flow of God's anointing. However, having said all of that, there are exceptions to what we have just described. There are times when God moves powerfully in the environment that we may consider hostile okay, to the flow of God's anointing. When we do not feel very anointed ourselves, there are times when God uses the one we least expect to work amazing miracles. We work through someone we would not consider anointed. Okay, this is big, guys. Okay, He works through someone we do not consider anointed or gifted to bring healing and deliverance, right? The Lord Jesus did not always have a great environment to minister under the anointing. Often he was surrounded by the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees. Um, many of them came questioning, ready to find fault uh, and to argue with him. But he still would go ahead and perform miracles. Okay? So how can we apply this? And some of the applications mentioned here is the anointed person or God anoints people to bring healing to the sick and oppressed. We need to pray for more power, more compassion and more humility. Right? We must come into a place of greater anointing. We seek him, we grow more in anointing. Okay? And the unrecognized persons. And then there are times that God can and will use people whom we may not we may not consider as anointed. They simply minister in his name based on his word and faith in his word. Okay. They simply minister in his name based on his word and faith in his word. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we are all called to do, right? Just remember, guys, that from the beginning. We've stated that every believer can minister in divine healing. Okay? 
every believer can minister in divine healing because that authority has been given to us, right? Uh, recently, uh, we've been doing the series on the authority that every believer has been given to. And we've been given that authority in the name of Jesus, right? Uh, when you look at um, the Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verse 5, uh, Jesus says, uh, you know, he's, he's telling Ananias, you know, the, the context there is uh, Paul has encountered Jesus, uh, you know, and on the road to Damascus, he's blind. And then while he, while Paul is in, in a house, Jesus is telling Ananias, I want you to go and meet Paul, for he is my chosen vessel to bear my name. Right? To bear my name. And, and so and we are all his chosen vessels to, who bear his name. Right? Uh, I mean, just think about every brand that is out there, right? A brand of cars or, or clothing brands, etc., um, etc. Et right? Um, all of them in the world, there's one thing in common. What they want you to do is they want you to bear their name. Right? They want you to show the, their brand name, like a Nike or a Reebok, or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, right? So there's a, and then there's a certain thing, uh, the, the level in society that is associated with the name that's given to the brand, isn't it? Um, and we must, we must come into that realization that, you know, as ministers of God, as believers, we've been given that, you know, um, his name, right? And so we function out of, out from the place of that authority based on his word and faith in his words, right? Uh, and point three there says, feeling the anointing. There are times when we can have tangible feeling of the anointing. And then there are times we do not feel anything. Whether there is feeling or no feeling, we minister by faith. Okay, whether there is feeling or no feeling, we minister by faith. Okay, feelings is deceptive faith. I mean, yeah, we we are we are emotional beings. Feelings is associated with everything that we do. Uh, we associated with everything when it comes to ministry and whatnot, even with worship. Right? We use that word "feel" so much. Right? I don't really feel like worshiping. I I don't. I just don't. I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. Uh, and sometimes we live life too much based on our feelings, isn't it? Um, but what we are encouraged here at this point is that whether you feel or don't feel, um, minister by faith. Faith is not associated with your feeling. Right? And the environment, uh, as mentioned, there are times when we think the environment is conducive for God to manifest his presence, but then there will always be a place. You are not always going to have uh, that environment. Okay? You are not always going to have that moment, you know, Benny Hinn with the choir singing hallelujah, you know, you are great. You are not going to have a 4,000 people choir members just backing you up and create, to create that conducive uh, environment. Uh, it's not always going to happen. You might be surrounded with um, just not in the right place. You get, you get what I'm trying to say, right? Uh, but you step out because of the authority that you're carrying and the name that you're carrying and you work and minister by faith, right? Okay, cool. So I hope you are with me. Um, so now from there on, we move on to the next, um, uh, the principle, which is the issue of sin and salvation, the issue of sin and salvation. So uh, if I had to paraphrase this section, this principle, uh, there are two ways that Jesus functions here, okay? First, he heals, and then he addresses the sin. In some cases, that he addresses the sin, and then he heals, okay? It happens in both cases. So here we see an example. Um, every person Jesus ministered to before the cross was unsaved, okay? Um, so there is this one incident where Jesus dealt with sin first, and then healed afterwards, Example, the healing of the paralytic. Uh, so where he says, son, your sins are forgiven you. And then he says, arise, 
take up your bed and go to your house. Okay, so he addressed the sin and then he declares healing. He performed healing. Okay, and then there are other instances where Jesus heals first and then afterwards dealt with the issue of sin and salvation. Right? Uh, in John 5, 1, 14, Jesus said, See, you have been made well. You have been made well, means a healing has been performed. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Okay, uh, and another instance that I'm, I'm remember of is also women caught in the act of adultery. Uh, you know, after, when when everybody else puts their stone down and he bends down, he asks, okay, does anyone uh, criticize you or ridicule you? Uh, he says, no. So then he says, okay, I do not so do. Uh, you know, go and sin no more. Uh, you know, so he, ex uh, he once again expressed the love of the Father in that instance. Uh, you know, so... Um, so we do not see Jesus in every situation attributing sickness to some personal sin in individual's life or in his ancestry. Okay, the one recorded case where his disciples asked him about this was in John 9 uh, about the, regarding the blind man, right? where they asked him, Rabbi, why is, uh, whose sin? Is it his parents' sin or is it this man's sin that he is born blind? And Jesus simply replies that neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Okay. Um, so the title of this principle is the issue of sin and salvation. And how can, how can we apply this in ministering divine healing? Uh, I says, we should not attribute every sickness to some sin in the individual's life. Uh, okay. We've got to, just be aware, be careful and how we go about, uh, you know, ministering in this case. There are times when God heals even before the issue of sin and salvation has been dealt, okay, as mentioned here. And there may be times when God will specifically lead you to deal with the issue of sin and salvation first before healing can manifest. Right? And if God heals, before the sin has been dealt with, reach out to see the person experience the greatest of all miracles, the experience of salvation. Okay, look at this point very clearly with me, guys. If God heals before the sin has been dealt with, reach out to see the person experience the greatest of all miracles. Right. And how many times has this, uh, and I've seen it happen in my personal life, and I'm, just, I'm pretty certain that most of us have seen this too, at least with, uh, you know, with, there were days uh, where there's so many healing crusades happen, used to happen, at least in my city, uh, in Bangalore, where, you know, all these evangelists from all over India and the world would come and have these healing crusades, uh, you know, etc uh, etc et and uh, so many people from different backgrounds of faith would come and they would be healed and then they would go on to encounter you know and experience salvation right uh, and I and, the, and that, that's amazing isn't it it's, and um, and so both has happened and uh, and so this is one of the principles okay so the issue of sin and salvation is another key thing when we are ministering uh, healing and deliverance. So that's uh, five principles that we've covered so far. And we have two more to cover. So, and I hope you've been following. And, uh, and since we've been talking about faith, I'm gonna believe in my faith that everybody is listening and not sleeping. Just kidding. Okay. So uh, what's the title of this, uh, of this chapter? Learning to minister uh, healing and deliverance. From Jesus, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, the sixth principle we will learn is the methods Jesus used. Okay, the methods Jesus used. So uh, there was no specific process or method Jesus used to minister healing and deliverance. He just did what he saw the Father do. All right? Uh, so look at some of the methods that he used. Uh, he used the laying on of the hands, the word of command, laying on of hands, plus the word of command. Uh, sick people touched him, right? 
uh, as he was passing by, uh, we know the issue of blood, uh, touched the hem of his garment. Right? And power went out of him, the word says, and healed her. Right? He had people act in faith, go wash in the pool, rise up, you know, uh, take up your mat and walk and so on. So he would release again the word of command and he would have them act in faith. Um, unusual methods here, yeah, spit, clay, finger in ears, uh, touch the tongue. Uh, and all of those references, uh, you can read about them in, in, the, in the scriptures mentioned uh, in the notes. Uh, he healed from a distance. He just released a word, uh, right? Your faith. Uh, he declared the work has, uh, work has done and told the person to go in faith. He sent his disciples to anoint with oil, etc., etc. And, and all of these methods, uh, I'm... I'm guessing, like, in, in everything that he did, it was the first time people have ever seen someone do something like that. Right? Uh, I just think, like, if it was the first time that Jesus made something out of clay, it must be the first time, you know, some, someone doing something like that or performing healing. So Jesus was like a trailblazer, like, setting the trend, you know, kind of a thing, you know. Um, but as we've learned from the very beginning, that it is not the process or methods, that it is in the person of Jesus, right? So these are the methods what Jesus used, and we'll see some of the applications of it. It says, we recognize and equip ourselves in the most common ways to minister healing and deliverance. Okay, we recognize and equip ourselves in the most common ways to minister healing and deliverance. When we minister, we use any one of the common ways available to us. Okay. However, we remain sensitive to the Lord's guidance by his Holy Spirit and to do things differently when he guides us to do so. Okay. Being sensitive is key, guys. Uh, you know, in ministering, healing, and deliverance, being sensitive to what the Lord wants to do is so, so key. And being obedient and acting on that is key as well. So we do not focus on any one method or process. But we remember that healing and deliverance comes from the Lord and not because of the method or process that is used to minister. Okay, We teach people not to focus on the method or process but on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is our healer, okay? And we must be careful not to make an idol out of the method of process. Um, we got to be sensitive in that case as well, okay? So that our focus is that we realize that Jesus is our healer, right? We've got to lay hands and pray for people. It's all good. We can't let one method or one process you, you cannot get fixated on that one thing and say, okay, this is how God's going to you know, minister healing. And that's, uh, that eventually becomes idolatry. Okay. And, uh, and I have, I've heard stories of uh, people where, um, you know, crazy things where God would ask, uh, ask a person. Uh, this is one instance where, you know, a person was led to pray for a couple and what the Lord was asking her to do was crazy. She's like, uh, she was like, okay, how am I going to do this? Should I even do this? Is this really God? So she takes this couple uh, to a private room, like a separate room where it's just the couple and her. And so the thing what the Lord had asked her to do was to take a, a glass of water and sprinkle water over them. Sounds crazy, right? Uh, imagine her, you know, this is what she was sensitive, this is what she was hearing the, you know, the Lord tell her to do. And so she takes this glass of water. She says, you know what? I'm just being obedient here. I know this is crazy. Uh, it's not me. And so she sprinkled the glass of water. And so as, as she did that, as she was obedient, um, the couple start weeping. And, uh, and so long story short, there's been a lot of challenges and difficulties that the couple have been uh, going through. Uh, but when that act, uh, when that, you know, act of faith was demonstrated, 
there was a sense of freedom that they experienced and they were weeping and weeping and weeping. Um, so does that mean she keeps throwing a glass of water on everybody from their own? <laughs> no, right? She was sensitive to what the Lord told her to do at that moment. And she was obedient and acted, exercised faith. Uh, remember, faith is spelled as a risk. Right? That's the risk she took. Well, if nothing happened, they were wet, they got to go and change. What's the worst thing that can happen, right? Go and change the set of clothes. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's related to methods Jesus used. Okay, and now coming to the final uh, principle is the nature of supernatural healing. Right? The nature of supernatural healing. Um, whenever Jesus ministered healing and deliverance, we noticed that the miracles were they were immediate. Okay, the miracles took place right then and there. Um, they were complete, means the individual was completely healed and delivered. It was verifiable. That means people could check and see that the miracle was genuine. And then finally, everything that Jesus did, all the miracles that he performed, glorified God and not man. The focus was on God. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, it says this is our standard that we must attain to, that we must press into, okay? Uh, we realize that when we minister, we do not always see such results, okay? However, we must press in to see the same, right? Uh, just because we pray uh, once, and if you don't see that happen, uh, don't let yourself be discouraged, okay? Keep pressing in, keep pressing in, keep pressing in. Uh, until you begin to start seeing uh, things happen. Okay, um, Bill Johnson says this best. He says, you pursue the supernatural until the supernatural starts pursuing you. Um, okay, I don't know how he comes with that. But then, yeah. um, so those are the seven principles, right? what we've learned, uh, that the norms that God expects us to, uh, you know, function through. He wants to partner with us because we've been, uh, we are in this co-mission with Him. We co uh, co-laboring with Him uh, as we minister healing and deliverance. But then there are also exceptions where He steps in, uh, you know, in His sovereignty. And even in that, He expects us to be sensitive. Right? God wants to come and move, and if we are not sensitive to the leading of his voice, um, God will still move because he is God, and he is compassionate, and he is loving, and he loves his people. Uh, but we would have just lost that opportunity for God to use us. Right? Um, so being um, having that hunger, the desire, and the thirst to increase in the anointing, to for wanting that more of God, because there is more available for you and I, right? There is always more available for you and I. To walk like Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, to walk in obedience, all of it, we need to hunger and desire, right? Uh, everything that we spoke about, passion and compassion, with that zeal, uh, with the sincerity, uh, with the long suffering, uh, even when you don't feel like uh, you press in, uh, you know, until you see things uh, begin to happen. Uh, we need to be encouraged and motivated to see things happen in our lives. Okay. All right. So uh, that is the conclusion of chapter four. Uh, so I am doing all right. Okay. All right, um, well, let's um, you know, we'll go into chapter five and see how much we can cover um, chapter five today. Okay, so chapter four was all about learning to minister healing and deliverance from Jesus. And then in this chapter, we see the secret to ministry as demonstrated by Jesus. Okay, the secret to ministry as demonstrated by Jesus. Um, We'll probably just focus on uh, one key point, and if time permits, uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes.
Okay, so just hang with me. Um, so there are four important keys or secrets to ministry as the Lord Jesus demonstrated it. Okay, so four key principles of uh, ways in how Jesus functioned. First one, ministering out of intimacy and obedience ministering based on the finished work of the cross, ministering from a place of dominion and authority, and ministering through the presence and the power of the Spirit. Okay? Um, so the first one here, talking about Jesus demonstrated in, what, in his ministry is ministering out of intimacy and obedience. Okay, uh, in chapter three, we see that uh, Jesus' love for his father, uh, you know, that how he was only moved with one vision, one mission, that he came to do the works of the father. Right, everything he did and said was in line with what the father wanted him to do and say. Right, so Jesus walked in a place of close fellowship with the father. He also walked in complete obedience to the Father. He did what he saw the Father do and taught what he learned from the Father. Okay, uh, if you remember from praise and worship class last uh, in last semester, we spoke uh, and we spoke on this word intimacy. Uh, we broke it down right into when you break that word down, it simply means into me. You see, because I show you right into me. You see. Right, into me. So the intimate relationship that Jesus had with the Father, right? When when Jesus is saying, "I only do what I've seen the Father do," is because he was in that intimate relationship. The Father is showing him. Because of that intimate relationship, Jesus was able to see what the Father is showing him, and therefore he was able to go ahead and do what he saw the Father do, and say what he's heard the Father say, right? Uh, he walked in that intimate relationship with the Father, and he also walked in obedience. Right? Intimacy is developed through spending time along with him in his presence, in worship and prayer. We grow in intimacy as we let his word fill us and rule every sphere of our lives. And we, again, saw Jesus model this, isn't it, guys? Um, you know, how many times do we read in the Gospels that he would cut, uh, you know, separate himself, disconnect himself from the crowd, and he would go and pray all night, be alone with the Father, pray early in the morning, before the dawn, before the sun rises, he would wake up and go and seek. He's the Son of God. And if he felt the need to develop his intimacy with his Father, how much more should we isn't okay so intimacy is developed spending time in his presence worship in worship and in prayer and and let his word fill us reading his word etc etc okay and it says true obedience is an expression of intimacy that is the result of intimacy what is the fruit of intimacy is obedience Okay, true obedience is an expression of intimacy. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 14 says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Right, so obedience is an expression of our relationship with him. We love him. We are his friends. Hence, we obey him. Okay. Um, this is very interesting quote uh, from John G. Lake. Uh, it says, healing is basically a spiritual thing. The power that heals the sick comes from God down through your spirit, out through your hands into that man or woman. If you are having the right kind of spiritual fellowship, you will have power with God and there is no escaping it. Okay, and if you remember, again, once again, in the previous chapters, we see that 
the equation is never wrong at his end. Right? The equation is never wrong at his end. We know his will. We know he has the power to heal the sick. Okay. So we come back. We rework our, the equation. It's like we, work, we pursue him. Right? We, we the hunger and intense desire for his presence. We pray. We seek him. We ask him to move through us, to use us as his vessels to minister healing and deliverance. Okay, this is, uh, this is true that when we are in right communion and fellowship with the Lord, there is not power enough in all hell to put disease upon our little finger. Okay. Um, Wow. I mean, if you know anything about John G. Lake, uh, you should read his biography. Uh, it's just amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, in fact, uh, well, just watch out your space, watch out the space for the assignment. I might just put it on today, your final assignment, and you'll see what it is. Okay? It is based around the works of John G. Lake. So just watch out. Okay, so that's the... Uh, that's the first key, as we see that Jesus ministered out of intimacy and obedience. We saw the power of it. And second, we see ministering based, that he ministered based on the finished work of the cross. Okay. Uh, it says, Matthew 8, 16, 17, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled with which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Right? So Jesus ministered based on what he would accomplish on the cross. Right? That's why Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law would, uh, you know, would get angry because every time Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, they were like, who is this man who forgives sins? With what authority does he forgive sin? Who is he to forgive sin? That it was like a blasphemy for them. But then Jesus knew already that the work that he would accomplish on the cross, right? And so what he did in the Gospels before his actual death on the cross was a foretaste of the benefits of his finished work on the cross. So Jesus ministered based on the finished work of the cross. Right? There's a scripture that says, right, in, the, in, in Revelations, I think, right, Behold, the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. Right? The cross was just an expression of God's forgiveness and love for the world. Right? So on the cross, the sin was paid, the sickness was removed, and Satan was defeated. Guys, 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 I was almost going to say church, but you know, if we can just fathom and help and ask God for us to have this revelation of everything that was accomplished on the cross. And if we have, if we are able to just fathom, I mean, what we can achieve in our ministry uh, to glorify God is will be unparalleled, right? Because like, on the cross, as it says, the sin was paid. Sickness was removed and Satan was defeated. Our enemy, our arch enemy, who wants to kill and destroy and steal every ounce of joy out of our lives, is defeated. And so, still, sometimes we we are defeated by a defeated enemy because we don't have the understanding, or we've lost the significance of the power of the cross. Right. So. What is left is for us to receive it by faith and walk in it. And that leads to us to the next point. Is that Jesus ministered from a place of dominion and authority. Right? He, well, he functioned from a place of dominion and authority. Right? Uh, the, the demons know who he was. Right? They, they were scared. And we see that in Luke 4, 34, they, they cry out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? 
did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And, and sometimes, and most of the times, we need to have the revelation of what these demons have of Jesus. Right? And another scripture, Luke 4, 36, again, very quickly after that, it says, what a word this is. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they came up. Okay, everybody who saw, who just witnessed what had happened, they were marveled and wondering, what authority is this? Right? For with authority he commands and power, he commands the unclean spirits. And, and you see the same kind of expression the disciples give him when he calms the storm, right? On the boat, he is sleeping. Everybody are uh, scared to death. And they wake up Jesus up and ask this incredible question saying, do you not care if you perish or if you die? It's an amazing question to ask God, isn't it? And, and he just declares peace over the storm. And everybody is like, in awe and wonder is thinking, what man is this? Like he, who he commands even the storms and even the storms and the waves obey him. Right? He functioned from a place of dominion and authority. Right? Um, and similar, we are called to function, uh, you know, in the place of dominion and authority as well. As just mentioned, uh, you know, we are doing the series on believers' authority in, in APC. And one of the points that we covered uh, the previous Sunday was that we've all been delegated this authority. Right? Uh, we, we've been given, you, you and I have this authority to speak to the storm to bind and to loose uh, the strongholds, to pull down strongholds, to break every chain in Jesus' name. You and I have that authority. It's been given to us, like in a, in a golden platter, a gift, right? And then finally, we see that Jesus ministered through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? Jesus operated with the power of the Holy Spirit in ministering, healing, and deliverance. Right? He promised us the same power of the Holy Spirit to be his witness. And the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. He is our creator. He gives life. It is the Holy Spirit that quickens us, our mortal bodies. And the power of the Holy Spirit flows through us to bring healing and deliverance. Right. And so if Jesus walked in intimacy and in obedience, and if Jesus ministered from a place of finished work of the cross, if Jesus functioned with authority and dominion, and if Jesus functioned in everything that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit, and all of that has been made available for us. How much more should we walk in intimacy and in obedience with the Lord? Right? How much more should we understand the power of the cross for what it has accomplished for us? Right? And we need to understand the power and the authority that's been given to us because of the cross. And then the same Holy Spirit that worked through Jesus Christ the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of us. Amen? It's, it all comes down to us for us to act in faith and exercise everything that we've been given in faith. And so that is how we will continue to minister divine healing. Okay, with that, we will uh, end today's session. Um, I hope you guys are all still alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining in, guys. Um, I will see you all next week. Okay. Thank you. God bless you. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.